Well, it's good to be with you guys. I guess, are we going to take up the offering then? Yes. <laughs> yeah, now it's good. Uh, I was with Seth, you know, the morning of the great camp takeover. Yes. And it was a blast to be a part of that and uh, to watch God move on your behalf. Amen. And uh, hopefully tonight you'll, you'll start to see that he doesn't just move on your behalf because of other people. He moves on your behalf because of you and that you're the important one to him. And it's not because you're with the group, it's because he loves you individually. So uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about love, not the kind you're thinking of, uh, but to kind of paint the struggle that we all go through, and I did until I was much older than you. Um, and that is that you were originally created in Genesis 1, uh, the Godhead got together and said, uh, let us create man in our image. Okay, that's Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And they, he said, let them have dominion over the earth, let them have dominion over the sea and everything that crawls. And Adam was put in the garden, Eve was created, they had perfection and then they sinned and they lost everything. And you know the story, And uh, but the point I'm trying to make is originally we weren't created for love. We were created to be love. In other words, God is love, right? That's what the scripture says. In 1 John 4, 8, I have to look at my, I don't have them. I know what the Bible says, but I don't always know where it says. <laughs> So 1 John 4 8 says, um, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you were actually created by love in that image, which means you are created to be love. As soon as Adam sinned, we lost that, and then all of a sudden we had the, the need to be loved. So we were created as love we lost it in adam and then we have the need for love and uh, so we're all born into Adam. you were born selfish you were born needy needing love um, i can tell you you were selfish because when somebody took your binky you screamed or somebody took your toy when you were a little kid you'd say mine okay it's it's all about you because from the moment that you were born, you've been seeking identity to know who you are. And because you were created by love, the image of love is in you, but it's not, it's not fulfilled because you're separated from love. Is that making sense? Yeah. And it's very, uh, it's very elementary. And I, and I will tell you this, that everything that matters in God is simple. I mean, don't make people, let people make things too difficult. The things that matter are simple. They're not always easy, but they're very simple. So we were created in, in the image of love to be loved, but because we were born into sin, we ended up needing love and had no identity. And so our selfishness is what has ruled us since we were little. Okay, when I was, and what happens is, I begin to look to get my identity from what I see in the world. So when I was like 10 or 11, I burned my arm and uh, went to the hospital, and I was sitting in the emergency room with my mom, and this guy walks in, he was about 19, 20. Long hair, jeans, no shirt, jean jacket, and boots. And I remember thinking at 11, that guy looks cool. <laughs> I want to be like that. And I, so fast forward, I'm 19. I graduated from high school. I'm with a whole group of people. And I look down, and I've got on boots, jeans, no shirt, and a jean jacket. And I had a flashback to that moment in the emergency room because that's where I set my identity to be. So I was trying to fill that need that God put in there for him 
but because I didn't know him, I found it in a 19 year old who looked cool when I was 11. And my whole life, whether I knew it or not, was to go after that image. Because I'm looking for that. I need an identity. And so I was known to be that guy for a while. And you're doing, you do the same thing. Not you're doing it, you'll, you'll have to evaluate. I always talk in uh, ideals, but I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you where you're at. Because he's after you to re-put in you the image you were created for, which was to be love, to be different than everyone else you know. And so whatever gets your attention will eventually get you. If you're doing, if you're going after uh, being needed to be liked, being known, being popular, having the right friends, having the right parties, all of those things will become who you're known to be. But you're always going to be empty. And I'm not saying it like I'm some evangelist saying, oh, you're always going to be empty. What I'm going to say is that at 7 in the morning when you're by yourself, you're going to be empty. Because the image that is in you still needs to be filled. And it can't be filled by anything except God. And so what the world produces in you is insecurity, fear, worry, anxiety, and we've all felt these things because we don't measure up, we're not good enough, we're afraid. You know all the different feelings that we have and the emotions. It produces unforgiveness, it produces bullies, Bullies are just insecure people. I was, I was a bully once and then I got beat up so then I became the bully person. I got chased home for like, I think six months. And then everybody kept telling me, just stand up to him, he'll back off. So I stood up to him and the next thing I knew I was looking up at the clouds. <laughs> so that's produced by a lack of identity. This guy was trying to get identity by being violent. I was trying to get identity by being cool. You're all trying to get identity, if it's anything other than God, by doing or being something other than you were created to be. And it sounds, the world puts this image on you that, that you think you're not quite it. And so you try to, to join with what you think is it, and yet the world is exactly 180 degrees away from God. The kingdom of God is here, and the world is here. And you're coming on youth group on Wednesday, hearing about the kingdom of God and wanting it, but you don't know who you are, so you keep going this way. Because this is where your identity is. And it's not supposed to be there. And in the kingdom, there's no insecurity, no worry, no fear. No fear of man, no need to be liked, no uh, insecurity. There's freedom. Because you have nothing to offer anybody else until you're full of yourself. Like every relationship I was in before I became a Christian was based on need, a lack of identity. So I would join with somebody who had something I wanted, and they would join with me because I had something they wanted, and we would suck the life out of each other, then break up and go find somebody else. Mm because we weren't designed for that. If you're not whole, you have nothing to offer except that. You're gonna suck the life out of somebody. And I, I bet if I ask you, I said, hey, how many relationships have been really good for a long time? And then the next thing you know, you're not even talking to each other. Most of you could say, oh yeah, I've got a relationship like that. It's because you finally ran out of what you could take. Relationships are, are designed to be given. They're not places to take. But if you don't have an identity, you're going to take because you're still trying to fill that hole. And so what happens, these, so I'm an adult, I hate you. 
I need to either print 16 size fonts <laughs> or get some glasses. Because <laughs> I keep taking them on and on. What happens is you start getting older. Now, you, some of you are um, probably late high school. Some of you are just going into high school. So you're in different stages. I get that. But what you're doing now is figuring out how to live broken so that you can sustain and be, you can live in this world. You realize you're not perfect, it's going to be a mess, you're just going to live broken, you're going to learn how to hide it, you're going to learn how to deal with your trauma in different ways. Some of you will have addiction issues, some of you will have interpersonal issues, some of you will have spiritual issues. We all end up with issues, okay? So if you have issues, you're like everybody else. So you can relax. It's all right. But if you don't learn to, to function properly, you have to learn to hide. Because you can't handle it. You don't fit. You're not, it's not working for you. But you can't, because you're insecure, you can't tell anybody else it's not working. You have to make sure they think it's working. And so everyone is hiding. And nobody's real. And the person, I, I bet also if I ask you, who's the person you're drawn the most to? They're the most secure person in your environment. Because you can feel it. They know who they are. And they draw, you're drawing to that because it's what's missing in you. And then you feel rejected because they don't need you. And they're open, but they're not clingy. I mean, it, it takes a while. I grew up clingy. I did. It took, I was married before I figured some of this stuff out. And we had to kind of grow up together in it. Because I was getting my identity by marriage, kids, adults put these expectations on their children if they haven't dealt with this. So they're not free either. But you have to learn to live or you can't function in the world. And so we learn to live broken and uh, insecure. And, but Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I think here's where, where we begin to, to, to get off. First off, we don't realize that we were created to be love and not uh, just get love. And also, Jesus didn't come to get you to heaven. And he didn't come just to save you. He came to restore the relationship that Adam had with the Father for you. So you can now go back and attach yourself to love, learn what that looks like, and then have something to give to the rest of the world. Because you are now being love. If you want to know what that looks like, read 1 Corinthians 13. Verses 4 through 7 is what you hear quoted at every wedding. Love is kind, patient, long-suffering, doesn't hold grudges, doesn't consider a wrong done to it. That's what we're supposed to be. Right? So when you have interactions with people at school or home or wherever it is you do, here it's easy because everyone kind of drops their guard here because you're kind of safe. At school, when people wrong you, you're supposed to respond in love. You're not supposed to go to a clique group and get your wounds massaged. Because they're going to take that life from you and you're going to take life from them and none of you are going to be well. And in this room are more disciples then change the world. But the same interaction that 11 people went and changed the world with caused one man to go hang himself. They all live with Jesus. So this, it's, it's serious. It's not like, don't, don't be afraid. Um, I'm just saying that you can't keep being in denial and expect that your life is going to go well because it's not. And you're gonna end up blaming it on circumstances, you're gonna blame it on other people, and you're still gonna be broken and have nothing to offer.
So I'll tell you how, how this works. And this first Thessalonians 5.23 tells us what this looks like. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Okay, sanctify means to make you whole. Okay, completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you are supposed to be, you're supposed to be completely sanctified, which means your your spirit, your soul, and your your body. Your spirit became brand new at conversion. That's a done deal. You became a new creature. If you're a believer here, that part's done. Uh, if you're not a believer, talk to Seth or some of the staff afterwards. You need to be, because everything else I'm saying doesn't mean anything if you're not trying to reconnect to your father. But your whole body, soul, and spirit is supposed to be handed over, sanctified back to the father. Uh, first, your, your spirit, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So you're a new creation, but that word actually means you're a prototype. There's nobody else like you on the planet. And you think, well, that's impossible. Well, there's no two snowflakes the same, no two waves, no two people. What happens when you're insecure and you don't know that you are love is you join with people who are like you and you criticize people who are different than you. In the kingdom, we are to celebrate the differences. If we're all gifted the same, it's going to be boring. If, if I can't celebrate your differences, I'm insecure. You're not the problem. So I need to realize, hey, you're a new creature and a prototype. You're a one of a kind. So I have a friend who, whether you believe this or not, he sees angels and sees spiritual things. I never do. And someone said, does that ever make you upset that you don't see them? It used to. And then I thought, well, I don't need to. He does. He'll tell me what's in the room, and I can celebrate his gift and then use my gift to bless him. But we're completely different people. But we celebrate our differences because we're both now learning to be love instead of needing love. And then secondly, you're supposed to renew your mind. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, okay, you got to get this picture. I'll be down here in just a second. You got to get this picture. You were, you were created to be love. You lost that in Adam and you became to needing love. You got saved and Jesus said, no, now you can be love again. And I've made you a brand new creature. So your spirit is new. It's there. Now he says, renew your mind be transformed by your thinking because you are the product of all of your thoughts up till today right now wherever you however you're sitting there I don't know what's going on in your mind if you're frustrated if your homework hadn't been done you know I was always the, like I was looking to buy homework from people. <laughs> my teachers had my mother's number on speed dial and that's like call mom um, so I don't know I totally lost my train of thought on that. That wasn't the Lord. Renew your mind. Oh yeah, I need to renew my mind. <laughs> so I need to change the way I think. How do I, how do I need to line up how I think? I have to line up with what Jesus says I am. I have to line up with the Word. So every time I have a thought that goes against this, I have to reject it. Okay. Uh, if I have a thought that says I'm not good enough, what does Jesus say? He says, I'm good enough. Now, I have a choice at that point to believe one way or the other. I either believe I am good enough, or in my insecurity, I believe I'm not. If I believe I'm not, I'm going to act like an orphan, and I'm going to act like someone who needs love. If I realize, you know what, I'm enough, then your criticism doesn't go in as deep still hurts. You just let me go in and take residence and I'm going to be okay. And God will deal with you. And then lastly, we're supposed to crucify our flesh. That doesn't mean you're going to die. 
You may want to die, but you're not going to die. According to Thessalonians, you're going to present your flesh back to God as consecrated. So your your spirit is now complete. Your soul, your your mind, will, and emotions are being renewed and changed. You're changing the way you think. You're coming against every lie. You know, every problem you have is a lie you're believing. It's something that you're believing that God didn't say. Or he's, or he's not thinking that towards you. Or you're not what you think you are. Or the devil has said, you're a numbskull. Disagree with him. You are a numbskull. But you've been redeemed. I don't disagree. The enemy doesn't tell you things that are completely absurd. He tells you things that are believable. So agree with him. Get that over with. And say, yeah, but. Yeah, but Jesus said this. But Jesus said that. So renew your mind. Then, when your flesh acts up, you have the strength to crucify it. Why? Because you don't want to give up love. Every time you, you neglect God, you pull yourself away from that connection of love. And you begin to find it in other places. And the thing is, it's not, it's not that God is angry at you, that he pulls away. It's for your protection. Okay? His presence is judgment. Remember when Moses wanted to see him? God says, nope, nobody's going to see me. And, and Moses said, I want to see you. He said, okay, I'm going to stick you in a rock, cover you, and walk by. And Moses got to see his back and see his glory. And Moses' face was shiny for 40 days. So much so that the people said, well, you just cover your face. You're driving us crazy. So his, it's not that God has a hammer and waits for you to get out of line and then smacks you. He pulls away because his presence is going to be judgment. When he comes, anything that's not of him will be gone. That's why the Bible says the hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Because when he's here, he's it. Whatever's not of him will not be there. And I'm not trying to get real theological. All I'm saying is that you were created by God himself with the Holy Spirit and Jesus to look like them. And we lost it, and we've been fighting ever since to get it back, and Jesus came and said, okay, now you can have it back. And in our religion, and in our performance, and in our comparisons with each other, and in our frustrations, we keep trying to earn a spot that God has given us. And he won't let you have it that way. He can't. Because if he lets you have it that way, you'll never fall in. And so as, as we're going forward, when you think of, I want you to, this is the only thought I want you to get for the day. You are created to be loved. And you need to act like love. Whatever that means. It's self-sacrificing. It doesn't need to be repaid. You know, if you do something for your parents and they don't acknowledge it, and you get upset, you didn't do it for them anyway. You did it for you. When you can do it for them, honestly, you don't need to be commended for it. And it's the same way with the Lord. When you can live with Him and just be with Him, and that's all you need, then everything else will be fine. And it all comes, it starts and ends with surrender. Every time something comes against Him, him, you have to just surrender. Say, so, yeah. It's going to. Because you don't want to be you don't want to be robots and you don't want to be dead. So it's just a fight from now until you get to eternity. And you're gonna get there one day. Just question of how much kicking and screaming along the way. Um, and it, it, the reason is that in John 17, 16, and I'll finish with this. He says, I am not of the world, and you, and they are not of the world, talking about us. But we definitely live in the world. 
right? So you're supposed to live in the world, but not be a part of the world. Right now, we live in the world and we try to be a part of the world because that's where we get our identity. When you switch your identity, you can be separate or you can be set apart, but not separate. And so you may miss on a few parties, you may not be called first one, but when things get rough, they'll be looking for you. Because God's always building in you a stability. We receive a kingdom that can't be shaken. When the world is shaking, and I commend you for you to even be here, I don't know that I would have lived as long as you have had I had to grow up in your generation and the things that you guys had to deal with. So there's been a special grace on you already to get you here. Amen. That God has not just plans for you. Plans come out of relationship. Let's just be clear. Whatever plans he has for you come second to you being with him. So that it doesn't matter to you what you're doing. You're just with him. So in this generation, to get your voice when this world is shaking and everybody knows it's shaking and I'm sure all you're hearing is how bad it is and how it's not going to make it and blah, 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 blah. It's going to make it and Jesus is going to come back one day and this will all be done. Until then, you are the only hope for the kingdom of God. The unshakable presence of God in the midst of shaking is what will draw people. And Jesus said, you, you don't have to think about being a great evangelist. He said, you draw, you lift me up, I'll draw them. Right. But the Holy Spirit needs your heart first and your surrender so that he can do what he needs to do. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm done. If I don't quit, I'll just keep going. crazy comic book okay you're going to get answers you're going to get something that fits for you to make it livable okay so I know people that come from horrific family situations they learn to function it's not great the more you know the word the more you can combat the thought see the thought comes it's not the thought's not the problem, it's when it takes root and becomes an action. So let's say, you know, I'm a guy, so when I was in high school, lust was a big thing. So it's not until, what's the Bible say? Don't commit adultery, right? What did Jesus say? Don't even think about it. So when, you, when I think about it, my first thought has to be, Jesus said, don't think about it, God help me not think about it. And then the grace comes to not think about it. But if I don't know the word, I have nothing to fight with. It's sort of like going into a battle with a bow and no arrows. You know? So, And if you don't know the word and you're struggling, call somebody who does. Carol used to help me all the time. I would call him and say, ah, I didn't know about this. What am I doing? And he would tell me. Of course, Carol's easy. He says, Here's the scripture, go do it. I'm like, okay. But every problem, every answer you need is in this book. In some form. So. Any other questions? What's a practical way to recommend getting into scripture if you've never been in it? Or like, start a Genesis, read all the way through. Just pick yeah, I'm not much, I mean, uh, let's see, when I started, I just would start reading. Uh, John, I think, is always a great place to start. All the Gospels are good because Jesus really dealt with how we live and what's going on in our hearts more than... Like, the Old Testament's amazing, and I love it. But it, it that was, ex, you know, the Old Testament, God's external. 
except for a few people. New Testament, God's internal for everybody. So once you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's in you. Anywhere you read, He can illuminate it to you. You need to get in something that you enjoy, look it up on Google to say, I'm interested in this topic in the Bible. And it'll give you something. And just start there. God honors effort, not perfection. Just if you just want it. You know, I am not a scholar by any stretch. I don't know Greek. Don't really even care. I don't need to know Greek. I need to know Him. And He will share with me everything I need to know. You're all qualified because of who you're with and who lives in you. Not because of your education. Education is awesome. And you need it. It's smart to get education. But it's not necessary to do what God's called you to do. And the works that He prepared for you were prepared for you before you were born. I think that's Ephesians 2.10. There are works that were prepared for you that you should walk in them. Okay, you're not going to walk in them if you don't know His voice and know Him and, and His Word and what He's asking you to do. But the thing is, if you want that, you can't miss it. So relax. Just be faithful. And He will make sure you get where you need to go. And you're going to have wilderness times. Sometimes He leads you there. Sometimes you're just stupid. And I've done both. The times I'm stupid, I end up in there a lot longer than I needed to. But he's never interested in, he's, he's not interested in a point in time, or a time frame. He's not going to say in two years we're going to do this. He's going to say when you get here, we'll go on. Right. And then he waits. And it's up to you how long that takes. And I told you if you kept this here, I'd just keep going. Hey. <laughs>